Uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of Colossians. So go ahead and open to Colossians 2. Uh, we're going to look at verses 8 through 15. And there's an outline in your bulletin if you want to follow along. We've been talking about uh, the fact that Christ is enough. We've been talking about the supremacy of Christ. Okay. Matt, looks like Maxie needs your help up there. Yeah, we've been talking about the this, this supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ, that salvation is through Jesus Christ, and that we have that salvation through our faith in Jesus. And Pastor Matt did a wonderful job last week talking about building our foundation on Christ, building our foundation on the knowledge of God's Word, uh, walking, walking with Christ. It's not a sprint, right? It's a walk. And, and that we do that together as the body of Christ. Well, ever since Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, <clears throat> Satan has been attacking the gospel. And he's been attacking the gospel through false teaching. Uh, during the time of, of Paul, different cults were starting to make their appearance. Uh, at the same time that the church was being established, there were different false teachers and different groups that were starting to come on the scene. Later on, in the next hundred years, we would see the Gnostics, who were a powerful cult. And so Paul wanted to remind the Colossian believers of their sufficiency in Christ. Because that's primarily where the false teachers were attacking. They were saying that Christ was not enough. In our world today, in our country, we see that cults are as prevalent as ever. Right? We see them all around us. We have a cult just across the street. And so we need to be on our guard. We, we need to know what we believe so that we are not led astray by their false teaching. Three of the, the most predominant cults in our country is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Unitarian Church, which is the Unitarian Universalist Church. I wanted to show you guys, uh, as we're getting started this morning, how these three different cults attack the doctrine of Christ. They attack what we believe about Christ and about the sufficiency of Christ. The first one is Mormonism. Uh, Mormonism rejects the orthodox view of the Trinity and the biblical view of Christ. Mormonism teaches that justification is not found through faith in Christ alone. That's key. They will talk about Christ dying on the cross, but justification is not found through faith in Christ alone. Jesus' death was not sufficient to save humans from their sins. Humans are saved through good works and baptism and membership in the Mormon church. Uh, the second large cult is Jehovah's Witnesses. And they reject the orthodox view of the Trinity and the biblical view of Christ. They believe that Jesus is a created being. As a matter of fact, they believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. They believe that Jesus' death was a ransom to Jehovah which removes the effects of Adam's sin laying the foundation for a new righteousness and enabling men to save themselves by good works. That's why you see them every Saturday out there. They're working hard because they're saved by their good works. The third group is the Unitarianism, or Unitarian uh, Universalists. And they reject the Orthodox view of the Trinity and the biblical view of Christ. 
They believed Jesus was a man who achieved a kind of divinity because of his obedience. Thus, the redemption of man is to be found in following the life and teachings of Christ, not through his death on the cross. You see the difference there? So as I've showed you these three different cults, what are, what are some similarities that you see in these three different cults? Anybody? Rejection of the Orthodox view of the Trinity. Yes, yes. Rejection of the Orthodox view of the Trinity, what the Bible teaches about Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. What else? Works. Works. Works yeah, works save you. Yeah, Christ's death on the cross was not sufficient to save us. Faith in Christ. We need works also. Yeah. They all acknowledge that Jesus existed. Mm -hmm. They all acknowledge, yeah, that Jesus existed, that he was a man who walked on this earth. Yeah, absolutely. They deny his divinity. They deny his divinity. Yeah. These three groups, along with many others, will claim that they are the true church. And so that's why we as Christians, we need to know what we believe. Pastor Matt made emphasis about that last Sunday, about knowing the gospel, teaching the gospel. We need to know what we believe. And we need to teach it. If you don't know the gospel message, then out there in this world, you're handicapped. It's like going, going to battle without... A weapon without your sword. You need to know the gospel message. Because we need to be on our guard. Uh, if you found Colossians 2, hey, let's go ahead and stand together. And as we read this passage uh, this morning, I want to take notice of what Paul is going to say about being taken captive by deceptive teaching. See what he's going to say about that. He says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world, rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them. Amen. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So the question that we're going to talk about today, it's on your outline, is what should we be attentive to, uh, knowing that there are these false teachings out there, knowing that there are these cults that are all around us, that are looking to deceive us and to deceive those that we love, what should we be attentive to at Riviera? And here's the first thing. Be careful that you are not seduced by worldly systems of belief. Friends, these worldly systems of belief have their origin in Satan. Satan is behind these worldly systems of belief. And he is deceiving many. Paul says in verse 8, he says, Be careful that no one takes you captive. <laughs> the word uh, for takes captive is, is a Greek word, <coughs> syllagogon. And syllagogon was a word that they used in war situations. It was a military term. And it had to do with taking your enemies captive. So Paul uses this military term so that we would know this is serious business. 
Man, we, we need to not mess around. We have an enemy, and that enemy is looking to take us captive. As I was thinking about that phrase, I was thinking about when I was a kid, and we used to play war with the neighbor kids in the community. And I had an older brother and a younger brother. And, and sometimes the older guys would play with us. And we would play kind of like a capture the flag type of thing. But the one thing that us young guys were afraid of was being taken captive by the older boys. Because we never knew what they were going to do when they took us captive. I mean, that was scary business. I mean, being taken captive, it might mean being blindfolded and given noogies until you start crying. It might mean given a wedgie until you can't walk. Or, or worst of all, they might make you eat a bug or a worm or something like that. I mean, it was serious business, playing war with the older boys. Well, fortunately, they never took it too far, fortunately. You know what? We have an enemy, hear this, who always takes it too far. Peter says in 1 Peter 5.8, he says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's our enemy. Peter calls him a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's why Paul says, guys, be careful that no one takes you captive. And how can we be taken captive? Through what can we be taken captive? He says, captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world. Now, philosophy in itself is, is not a bad thing. Uh, the word, the Greek word is philosophia, philosophia, and it means a lover of wisdom. That's what it means. It's not, it's not a bad thing in itself, but the philosophy and the teachings that were going on in Colossae were dangerous. Paul's going to even say they were satanic. It was a worldly philosophy that Paul calls empty deceit based on human tradition. Empty deceit based on human tradition. Now what exactly were the, the false teachings that were being taught in Colossae? There's a lot of debate about that. We're going to get into that more next week. N.T. Wright, a Bible scholar, says that they were nothing more than the oral traditions of Judaism that were being taught. That these false teachers were trying to convert these new converts to Judaism. Kind of like what was going on in Galatia, right? Remember when we studied Galatia? Curtis Vaughn, a Baptist Bible scholar, thought it was more likely the pagan philosophical theories of the day. Colossae, if you remember, was, was on Asia Minor. And that was just across the Aegean Sea from Greece. Alexander the Great, when he conquered the world, he spread the Greek religion and the Greek philosophies to that whole area. So those pagan religion, that pagan philosophy was very prominent in that area. Could have been. Whatever these ideas were, Paul says they were based on human tradition. Now, every family has a tradition, right? Every, every, every family, we've all grown up in families, every family has a tradition. Every family has, has a philosophy that they live by, whether it's something that you're aware of or maybe you're not aware of, that motivates what we do. Okay, in my grandma's house, it was cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> that, was, 
That was the philosophy of my grandma's house. How many had, had a grandma that was like that, right? Yeah. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I'll tell you what, one thing that we never did in my grandma's house was show up to supper with dirty hands. Man, I tell you what, if that happened, you were in trouble. Other homes uh, might be knowledge is power, right? So, so life is about accumulating as much knowledge as you can, uh, being educated, because education means success. How about this one? Too many days on the couch lead to the poor house. <laughs> Ever heard of that one before? Well, I'm pretty sure I made that one up. <laughs> But it's true, right? It's the idea of laziness leads to being poor. So every family has a philosophy. What was, what was the underlying philosophy of the home you grew up in? Think about that for a second. What was the underlying belief that was taught in your home? For some of us, it was good things. Uh, for some of us, it was bad. For some of us, the underlying philosophy was a Christ-centered philosophy. But for others, it was a worldly philosophy. Friends, we need to be aware of that, right? We need to be aware of the philosophies that, that we buy into. And maybe sometimes those philosophies were taught to us when we were children. But we need to be aware of that. Paul says, not only was this deceptive philosophy based on human tradition... But it was based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Now this statement, elements of the world, it's a hard one to interpret. Because scholars say there are multiple meanings for the Greek words. Curtis Vaughn says originally it referred to the letters of the Greek alphabet. Its original meaning being things in a row, right? Like A, B, C, D, E. <coughs> but the Greek alphabet. Then it came to mean the elements of learning of the physical world, such as the moon and the stars. Lastly, it came to mean elemental spirits, the supernatural powers believed to preside over and direct the heavenly bodies. The ESV version translates the verse, the elemental spirits of the world. Okay? So it could be that this empty philosophy was based on elements of learning, pagan learning, or elemental spirits. And I tend to believe it's the latter rather than the former. That Paul is saying, hey guys, you need to know something. Not only is this deceptive philosophy based on human tradition, but it's also based on elements of the world. Spirits, demonic spirits, are behind these teachings. And you need to know that. This warning to not be taken captive is not <coughs> just important to those living 2,000 years ago. It's just as important to us today, right? I mean, it's just as, as relevant to us today. Sometimes we don't even realize the deceptive philosophies that we're buying into. One of the most deceptive philosophies in the world today is not a new philosophy at all. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You know what it is? It's the belief of secular humanism. It's the idea that you are the captain of your own universe. <coughs> you don't need anybody, especially you don't need a God. You have the power within you to accomplish whatever you desire to accomplish. Sound familiar? Yeah. I was reading a couple quotes by some teachers in the, in the human potential movement. One of them, Christy Bowman, here's what she says. 
She says, human potential is amazing. We have the capacity to create a world that is peaceful, one that spreads kindness and love rather than hatred. If we believe it to be so, it will be our truth, and we will create it. That sounds like the line that uh, Satan pitched Eve in the garden, right? <laughs> hey, we will create it. Veronica Tudeleva says, We sacrifice our potential because we do not know that we are pure potential. Wow. Pure potential. Not potential in Christ. You are pure potential. You and yourself have the power to do whatever you want to do. Friends, this, this teaching of secular humanism, it's, it's infiltrated every sector of our society. It's in our education. It's in our government. It's in our literature. It's even in our entertainment. Right? See if some of these lines sound familiar to you. You can become or achieve whatever you set your mind to. Sound familiar? Or your will? Or your heart? How about this one? If it brings you happiness, then do it. Who cares how it affects others? It's all about you. Don't let others impose their meaning or values on you. Create your own meaning and values. Right? It goes back to the idea that you are the captain of your own universe. You are the God of your world. And of course, live and let live. Right? That's a big one for Eugene. Live and let live. Riviera, we need to recognize that that these deceitful philosophies, these are not from God. They have their origin in human tradition. And I believe underlying human tradition is the work of Satan. Trying to get people away from God, like he did with Adam and Eve. But the truth that we need to know is the second point. We have everything we need in Christ for salvation. The truth is, we're not God, but we have God inside of us, which is everything we need. Let me say that one more time. We are not God, but we can have God inside of us, which is everything we need. Paul says it this way in verse 9. He says, For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by Him. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Back in chapter 1, Paul said it this way, He is the image of the invisible God. When Jesus Christ walked this planet over 2,000 years ago, He was God in a bond. Hebrews 1 says He is an exact representation of the Father. When you see Jesus, you're seeing the fullness of God inside of him. When I was a kid, one of my favorite shows was The Incredible Hulk. And I love that show. I look forward to it every Friday night. Bill Bixby played Dr. David Banner. Any, any Incredible Hulk fans? I didn't know. Okay. Some of you younger guys, uh, later generation. This is the original show. Dr. David Banner, he was, he was kind of one of those a little bit, you know, kind of an intellectual type, kind of nerdy a little bit. He was kind of a wimp, too. Remember that? Sooner or later in the show, he would run into some bad guys. And those bad guys, they would start intimidating him. 
or people that he loved and cared about. And I would be thinking, hey, don't go there. Careful. Don't go there. Don't get that guy mad. And what would happen when he got mad? He'd become the incredible hope. Lou Ferrigno. And man, I'll tell you what, when he became the incredible hope, he kicked some rear ends, didn't he? I mean, he, he made the bad guys pay. Well, the essence of the Incredible Hulk was in Dr. David Banner, right? They were one. They had the same essence. And Paul is saying, guys, Colossians, the essence of God is in Jesus. When you see Jesus, you are seeing God inside of him. He may not have looked like much, but he had the power to change the weather. He had the power to heal the sick. He had the power to resurrect the dead. And he has the power to change your life and change my life. Right? He is the image of the invisible God. Paul says that you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. Now, when we are filled by him, that doesn't mean that we become God, right? Just because we put our faith in Christ and because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, it doesn't mean we become God. I like how John Calvin says it. He says, ye are made full does not mean that the perfection of Christ is transfused into us, but that there are in him resources from which we may be filled, that nothing be wanting in us. So Christ isn't transfused into us, but in him the resources of Christ are in us and made available to us. That we may be filled, that nothing may be wanting in us. What is, what is Calvin trying to say? Calvin's trying to say this. Jesus Christ is all you need. He's all you need. I love how Paul says it in Romans 15. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So how does it happen? It happens as we trust in God so that you may, be, may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So those resources are made available to us. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have Jesus' Spirit in us. And so as we trust Him, as we depend on Him, then we have those resources available to us. Next, Paul repeats what he said back in chapter 1. He says, who is the head over every ruler and authority? Christ is the head. He's the head over every ruler, whether it be earthly or in the heavenlies. He's the head over every authority, whether it be a, a natural authority or whether it be a supernatural authority. And whether they recognize it or not, Every ruler and authority is subjected to Christ. He is the head. The rest of this section, Paul describes what we have in being filled by him. What Paul called the glorious riches of this mystery. He says, you are also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands, but by putting off the body of flesh, in the circumcision of Christ. What were the false teachers teaching? Right? I, I said it earlier. What were they teaching? They were teaching that to be accepted by God, you needed to have, you needed to go through the, the circumcision. Circumcision was a part of being accepted by God. That's what we see in, in Galatians. But Paul says, you were circumcised in him 
with a circumcision not done with hands. In Romans 8, he says it this way. He says, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise, not from man, but from God. What matters is not going through the physical ritual of circumcision. What matters is having your heart circumcised by God. Having the Holy Spirit renew your heart. It's not about keeping the law, the letter of the law. It's about faith in God. And praise comes from God, not from man. Paul says, by putting off the body of flesh, in verse 11. In a Mosaic law, the physical act of circumcision representing the cutting away of uncleanness. <clears throat> John Calvin interpreted the body of flesh to represent the accumulation of corruptions. So Calvin's saying, by the body of flesh, he's saying all the things that we have done before Christ, all the sins, all the transgressions that we have done. Christ has dealt with that. When we come to Christ, our, our old man is put to death. We have a fresh start in Christ. This is what baptism in Christ Jesus represents. He says it this way in verse 12, When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. What does baptism represent? Right? When we, when we are baptized, we are identifying with Christ. We are identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Friends, if you're here today and you have not been baptized, you are missing out on something. Okay? I want you to think about that. Pray about that. If you have not been baptized, you are missing out on a very important part of your walk with Christ. The sacrament of baptism is an outer symbol of an inner work of grace. Putting to death the old man. Forgiveness of sins. And our new life in Christ. Paul goes on to say in verse 13. He says, and when you were dead in your trespasses. And in the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. <clears throat> Friends, every single one of us, before we came to Christ, and maybe you're here today, maybe you have not put your faith in Christ. I don't want to assume that everybody here is a believer. But apart from Christ, you are dead in your trespasses. Ephesians says that you are an enemy of God. But the wonderful thing about our God is that He did not want to leave us in that God-forsaken place. In His mercy, in His love for us, He sent Jesus to this earth. So all those sins could be dealt with. He forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligation. How many of you have the Ten Commandments memorized? Some of you. Okay. Guess what? Every single one of us have disobeyed one of those commandments. Amen? Every single one of us. And you know what happens when we disobey one of the Ten Commandments? What happens is, according to Romans 6.23, Paul says, the wages of sin is death. So when we disobey God, what happens is we accrue a debt 
to God. An obligation to God. The wages of sin is death. And the only way to pay that debt is for us to die. For us to shed our blood. I love how C.S. Lewis illustrates that in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I love that story, right? Edmund, he made that pact with the white witch to follow the white witch. But then it led to being a prisoner to her. And he wanted out of that. He was able to escape. And he was able to come to Aslan. And all of the followers of Aslan, but the deal wasn't over yet, was it? Because he had made that vow. He had made that pact with evil. There was a debt that had been accrued. And the only way that debt was going to be paid off was by the shedding of blood. And one of the most wonderful scenes in the story is when Aslan steps forward, right? The great lion. <coughs> he steps forward and he gets up on the table and they shave off his mane and they tie him down and the <coughs> white witch thrusts that dagger into his heart. The debt was paid. The obligation was gone. <coughs> because of Aslan. Of course, what does Aslan represent? Aslan represents Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ dealt with your debt and he dealt with my debt. <coughs> By shedding his blood on the cross. He nailed it to the cross. And it was done away with once and for all. And because of that, verse 13, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly to triumph over them. <laughs> you know, when I, when I look at that verse, I think of the image of a, a victorious general. I don't know if you can see that in the image there. Uh, a victorious general who, who had just won a battle. And now he's coming back home. And, and in his train and, and in, in the parade behind him is all the spoils and all the captives of war. And their heads are down because they're humiliated, right? Because they've been defeated. Satan had a plan from the very beginning. He knew he could not defeat God. So what did he do? He went after God's prized creation. Mankind. If he could just get mankind to rebel against their maker, then he would be victorious. And he was successful. But God sent his son on a rescue mission. Right? And so Satan knew that he was in trouble. And so he thought, well, if I can just get one of Jesus' followers to betray him, if I can just put him to death, then I will be victorious. And that's exactly what happened, right? He got Judas to betray him. And Jesus was completely innocent, but Pilate sentenced him to death. Why? Because Satan was working in the crowd. And I believe on that day, Satan, he was throwing his hands in the air and all the principalities, they thought they were victorious because Jesus Christ had been killed. But what they didn't realize in putting Christ to death <coughs> is that they unlocked God's mysterious plan that he had put in place from the very beginning. And that through Jesus' death and resurrection, Satan, all the rulers and authorities had been defeated and they had been disgraced. Why? Jesus had triumphed over them. It's the gospel, right? It's the greatest news ever. Friends, I want you to hear this in closing this morning. This is very important.
Paul, with a pastor's heart, pleaded with the Colossians. He did not want them to be taken captive by deceitful philosophies, by worldly philosophies. He wanted them to know that Jesus Christ is all they need. And friends, I want you to hear this loud and clear today. I know this is my heart, Pastor Matt, the deacons. I want you to hear this loud and clear. Do not be deceived by philosophies, by evil deceit. Because there are a lot of false teachers out there. And they will tell you that Jesus Christ is not all you need. You need something else. But I want to say to you today that you have all you need in Jesus Christ. So put your faith in him. Put your trust in him. Walk with him. Grow closer to him. Because he's all you need. And I'll say it. Would you pray with me? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up as I'm closing prayer. God, thank you. Uh, this wonderful passage in Colossians. Lord, thank you for, for speaking through the Apostle Paul. <coughs> Lord, for the challenge that you gave him into the, into the Colossians over 2,000 years ago, Lord. And we know today as, as the time of your return <coughs> grows near, we know that there will be more false teachers. There will be more false messiahs. There, there will be the false Messiah, the Antichrist. <coughs> and God, I just pray for all of us that, that you would give us discernment, that you would give us the eyes to see what we're listening to, what we're reading. Lord, show us what, what is truth and what is not. God, because the last thing that any of us want is, is to allow a deceptful philosophy to lead us away from you. And the last thing that any of us want is to have those lies keep people that we love and care about from coming to Christ. So Lord, I just pray that you would give us that wisdom, that give us that knowledge, and keep us close to you. Pray this. Amen. <coughs>